Mark chapter 8, 38. Now it's the Lord Jesus Christ talking that passage, and he says something very profound in that passage that ought to give every child of God something to think about and act on. And it's a final statement. It's a statement that whosoever is ashamed of me and my words and this adulterous and sinful generation, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he come in the glory of his Father with the holy angel. That's the statement. And the idea is if you're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of you. That's the idea. Uh, again, positively speaking, he says in another passage, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. I know perfectly well that a man can be saved by grace through faith by simply believing on Jesus Christ. I understand that. I understand the man doesn't have to come forward an invitation to receive Christ. I understand that. I understand the man all has, man has to do is believe and that kind of thing. But you want to play it safe. Christ said, if you confess me down here, I'll confess you up there. You make sure you spend a lifetime confessing Jesus Christ down here so there can't be any mistake in judgment about the matter. If you wonder whether or not a fellow's a Christian, nine times out of ten he's not. Now he said, Whoever be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he come the glory of his Father with the holy angels. That's, that's the statement. And I'm going to talk to you a while tonight about this subject of, uh, of being ashamed of Jesus. And I want to give you some reason tonight why you should not be ashamed of him if you are ashamed of him. Now, I understand perfectly that in America today there are many people who are ashamed of Jesus Christ, and many of them are Christians. Many of them are Christians. They're ashamed. Uh, they're, they're not like the, the bride of Christ in the Song of Solomon that says, This is my beloved, this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. That is, the bride of Christ in the Bible is not ashamed to confess it. She says, this is my beloved, this is my friend, O daughter of Jerusalem. But some Christians act like they're kind of embarrassed to be caught in that kind of company for some reason. And I'm going to talk about tonight a while about why you should not be ashamed of Jesus Christ. And the first thing I want to say about the text is, you shouldn't be ashamed of Jesus Christ because he wasn't ashamed of you. Now, if the Bible's right, and you know me when I say it, I have no doubt in my own mind. If you've got doubts in your mind, why, that's your problem. I don't have a doubt in my own mind. <clears throat> I have no doubt in my own mind when the Bible said that Christ died for my sins according to the Scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day from the dead according to the Scriptures, that that's just what he did. Furthermore, I have no doubt in my own mind that when he says uh, God commanded his love towards us in the while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, I assume that's me. I assume that's me because Christ said, I come not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. That's me. I assume Paul says this is a faithful saying with all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. If he came to the world to save sinners, I assume that's me. In other words, I assume that Jesus Christ uh, loved me and died for me personally, and when he shed his blood in Calvary's cross, he did it for me. Uh, the Son of Man has not come to call the righteous but sinners, that's me. Christ died for sinners, that's me. Uh, Christ was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, with his stripes were healed. I know something happened to me the day I met Jesus Christ that never happened to me before, and has never happened to me since, and couldn't happen to me again. And I know all the education in the world, and all the travel in the world, and all the science in the world, and all the learning in the world, and all the wisdom in the world could not do for me in 27 years what Jesus Christ did for me in 15 seconds. So I assume when the Bible says he stood up for me that he did and took, uh, took, uh, took my sins in, in his own body on the cross. The Bible said, wounded for my transgressions, bruised for my iniquities. To do that, he, he couldn't be ashamed of me. If he, the idea of dying a public death as a criminal, and we know how he died. We draw him, you know, with a loincloth on for the sake of decency, but we understand each other. I mean, they shot dice for his garments. He was naked. He was naked. You mean to tell me somebody that hang up that on a tree publicly, uh, in public, naked, uh, dying for somebody? Do you mean to tell me he was ashamed of them? Why, if he was, he, if he went through that for me, and the Bible says, and the Bible says he did, and I believe what the Bible says, if that's true, there's one thing for certain: he wasn't ashamed of me. And if he wasn't ashamed of me, the question comes up: Why should I be ashamed of him? Did you know you have a right at times to be ashamed of anybody in this world except Jesus Christ? Isn't it a strange thing if somebody asks you who you're married to, you tell them. They ask you what the name of your son is, the name of your daughter is, you tell them. They ask what the name of your mother and father is, you tell them. You're not ashamed if your mother or father showed up here tonight in this building, you wouldn't be ashamed to confess that was your mother, that was your father. And yet the truth of the matter is, there are times 
but you have a perfect right. Uh, of course, if you're a child, you better be careful about it, honor your father and your mother. But inwardly speaking, I'm talking about, there are times when you have a right to be ashamed of your mother and father by the way they act at times. Did you know you have a right to be ashamed of the way your children act at times? I, I, might have, I always haven't been always proud of my kids. They haven't always been proud of me. You've got a right to be ashamed of your wife. You've got to be ashamed of your, a right to be ashamed of your mother, your daddy, your children, and ashamed of yourself many times. But I'll tell you somebody, you haven't got any right to be ashamed about it all. And that's Jesus Christ. Don't you preach the ruckin' about love. Don't give me this stuff. I get so tired of these folks, you know, the mouth, not enough love, not enough love. You don't have enough love to confess Christ publicly. You go soak your head in the dumpster, fella. Don't talk, talk to me about this love stuff, this love stuff. Christ said, if a man love me, he'll keep my words. You kept his words? Don't you talk to me about love. You take over here overseas right now, we got a fellow over there, we got a fellow over there in Australia right now named Wheat, and he's a fine fellow, loves the Lord and believes the book, he's a soul winner. He's a conservative fellow, he's a moderate, he's not a ramble rouse or anything. And you've got fellow right now, right over there, there's some fellows from Bob Jones over there that are trying to get him off the mission field because he believes the King James Bible is the Word of God. The trouble with these little power-mad uh, Protestant popes is they think if you don't agree with them, you're a heretic. And try to get the fellow off the mission field if you believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. Spurgeon said he believed it was the Word of God. John Bunyan said he believed it was the Word of God. Bob Gray said he believed it was the Word of God. Lester Olaf said he believed the Word of God. What you trying to kick a fellow off the mission field for for believing what they believe? I am mean, all that stuff. Well, you know, Ruckman doesn't have enough love. Let me tell you something. If you love him, you'll keep his words. You got his words? Got kind of thin there a minute right in there, didn't it? Have you got, how many of you got his words? Let me see your hands. Okay, well if you don't have him, don't talk to me about love him. Don't give me that gas, okay? He said, if you love me, you'll keep my words. Now you shouldn't be ashamed of Jesus Christ because he wasn't ashamed of you. You take over there in, uh, in, uh, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, oh, right after I got saved, I heard about a young Jewish fellow over there that got saved, and he went back up to Long Island to witness to his rich Jewish parents. And about the same thing happens to a Jew when he gets saved, it happens to a Catholic when he gets saved, only more so. And his parents warned him not to come. But he went up there and witnessed to him anyway. And he got back and told us about it later, about his experience. And what he did, he got on a, he, he couldn't uh, get enough money to get back. He had to ride the, ride the freight, ride the rails coming back. He took a bus up there. And when he got up there in the dead of winter, he went to the, his house where his parents lived, and they were rich folks out in Long Island. And he came up there in the dead of night about, oh, about 9 o'clock and knocked at the door. And a window opened upstairs. His mother stuck her head out the door and out the window. And she said, they had your funeral last week. Bam, down comes the window. Now, ain't that a happy homecoming? We had your funeral last week. That's what happened to that fella. And he went back down, on down to the train station and couldn't get a ticket and climbed aboard a boxcar in the middle of the winter with nothing on but an overcoat, no hat, no gloves, and not a very thick overcoat. He came all the way back to Tuscaloosa on a boxcar in a temperature about 10 to 15 degrees. And I asked him how it was, and he said, I never had a better night's sleep in my life. And I said, how do you figure? I said, I don't know how to figure. I just know when I got that boxcar on that coal, I just slept like a baby and never hardly woke up when we got past Atlanta. You say, why did God take care of him? He wasn't ashamed. He wasn't ashamed. Christ said, if you're ashamed of me and my word in this adulterous and sinful generation, he said, I'll be ashamed of you when I come in the glory of my Father with the holy angels. Now you shouldn't be ashamed of Jesus Christ because he commanded you not to be ashamed of him. He said what? He said, you shall be my witnesses, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? He commanded you to witness. You shall be my witnesses, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? If you love him, you're going to keep his commandments. You know, I, I must say that, I must say, and I, I, I don't particularly like to say it, but I'm going to say it because it's so when I believe it. Sometimes some of our colored brethren put us white folks to shame when it comes to witnessing. You take a fellow foreman, he'll speak up. He'll speak up. You take Reggie White. I don't know what he plays. He plays, you know, slam back for some team. And, uh, but you take that fellow, he'll tackle a guy, knock him down, get up and slap his hand, say, bless you, Jesus, glory to God. <laughs> I bet that shakes up some of them Catholics. <laughs> They've had to triple team him to stop him at times, that old boy. And he come out of there and the newspaper reporters start giving an interview, you know, and take a microphone alongside him. 
and say, well, now, Reggie, what about this? And what about this and that? And Reggie will talk to him about a half minute, and then he'll start witness for Christ. And that fellow pulled the microphone away, and Reggie grabbed him by the hand and said, I ain't through yet. <laughs> I like that man. You know what that means? That means he's not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Are you ashamed of Jesus Christ? He commanded you not to be. You take that form. And I never forget one time I saw him leaving the dressing room after fighting somebody. I don't know who it was. But I remember Howard Cassell. Who could forget Howard Cassell? I mean, what a, what a, what a, what a blank man. <laughs> what a blabbermouth. <laughs> And he was going along there with this microphone after leaving this meeting with Thorman, interviewing him. And, and he was uh, talking with him and saying, well, what was your strategy for this fight? And he said, well, I just asked the good Lord to help me. He said, no, I don't mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, he was spaced out with that fella. And said, I mean, but, 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 you know, your leg wasn't in very good condition. And, and the rumor had it, you, you might be able to, your leg would give out away on you. And, and uh, how, how did you handle that fight in the view of the fact that your leg was, wasn't uh, exactly what it should be? And he said, well, I just asked the Lord to take care of my leg and hold me up. And I'm, 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 I'm trying to get that microphone away from him. Boy, they, hey, listen, that world got no use for Jesus Christ. Anytime you think they do, just start witnessing for him. I mean, what could be funnier than a pope getting up the United Nations to talk about world problems and world peace? What could be any funnier than that? I mean, he's the vicar of Christ, is he? He represents Jesus Christ, does he? Okay, why doesn't he have them all stand up and say, now let's all stand, the whole United Nations, all you Muslims, Buddhists, and Taoists, and Jews, and Protestants, let's stand and sing, all hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all! Imagine a pope talking that way. <laughs> Let me try it. Give old junkyard dog Ruckman a crack at it, okay? Just one crack. Oh, five feet eight, 175 pound Ruckman. Just give me one shot, baby, and watch what happens. <laughs> You think I'm kidding. <laughs> well, I ain't. Listen, I'll tell you, if you ever meet a, hear me deny Christ, it'll be under torture. If you ever meet a deny Christ, it'll be under torture, brother, and nothing short of it. He said, he commanded me not to be ashamed of him, and by his grace, I'm not going to be ashamed of him. He commanded you. There was a fellow named Alvin Dark, or Dart. I don't know all those athletes' names. He was a, the manager of the something athletics. What's the athletics? That's a baseball team. What, what city? Oakland. Okay, well, about 10 years ago, he got saved. And I mean, he got a dose. He got a dose. And boy, the, the newspapers began to steer clear of him and, get, and kind of handle him kind of with kid gloves. And I asked him one time about some rival coach, you know, he's having trouble with that he witnessed to. And they said, what do you think about so-and-so? He said, if he don't repent of his sins, he's going to burn in hell. Oh, my God, man. Oh, brother. You talk about getting rid of a fella quick, boy. I mean, they slammed him down shut quick. I like those boys with guts, man. I like them fellas with guts. I like that guy like Storch. Uh, his name is Noah Stroke. S-T-R-O-C-H, Stroke. And Stroke, he has witnessed to every player in the American Baseball League for something like 20 years and put a Bible in every dugout of every major team in that league. Just walk around the dugout. Here's your present, boys. <laughs> Don't you know some cuss and spit tobacco juice? No, a fool, holy jelly. Yeah, there's a Bible in that way. <laughs> He don't care. You know why? He's not ashamed of Jesus. Amen. I want to say something else about this matter. If you don't witness for Jesus Christ to speak up for Jesus Christ, you're ashamed of Jesus Christ, you'll backslide. You'll backslide. We got a world fed with backsliders, backslidden Christians. I think, I think, I think Pensacola has a thousands of Christians in it. I'm much more lenient with salvation than some of the brethren are. I think a lot more people are saved than, than what they, they say are saved. I really do. I mean, I'm thinking Pentecostal. I'd say in Pentecostal, you probably have 20,000 saved people. That's almost one-fourth of the population. Now, some of the brethren don't agree with that, you know. And they say, oh, well, no, that isn't true. You know, it isn't one-fourth. It, one it isn't near that much, you know, probably just about a thousand. I don't, I don't believe that. I've done personal work all over this town. I think this town is filled with Christians. The trouble is they're just not worth shooting. <laughs> I mean, it's got about 20,000 Christians. Then out of the 20,000, it's got maybe about uh, 4,000 the Lord can count on. And out of about 4,000, about 1,000 get something done. But God's people shouldn't be ashamed of Jesus Christ because they'll backslide if they don't. You keep your mouth shut and keep your mouth shut and keep your mouth shut. Person, you'll get in a mess like Simon Peter got into. 
And the sign Peter got around there warming himself with the fire there where the Lord's enemies were. And about that time somebody said, are you a Christian? No, I ain't no Christian. Never saw the man. Never heard of him before in my life. Well, you're from Galilee in there for those parts, aren't you? Yeah, but ain't no Christian. Yeah, but you kind of look like a Christian. You got that kind of, you know, that kind of, kind of glow, that kind of a clean-cut look about your face. Uh, I bet you're a Christian, aren't you? No, I ain't no Christian. Have a beer, Pete. No, thank I don't drink. What's the matter? What's the matter drinking? What, what, you got something against drinking? No, I don't have anything against drinking. I just don't care to drink. Thank you. Well, I bet you're a Christian. Aren't you a Christian, Pete? No, I ain't no Christian. <laughs> Haven't heard you tell a dirty joke all evening, Pete. You sure not sure, Christian? Blankety blank. No, I ain't no Christian. He began to curse and swear. That guy got through cussing. The air was blue, man. Them Roman soldiers sitting around that fire were taking notes for drill the next day. <laughs> and he got through cussing. The air was blue. And about the time he got cussing like that, somebody said, well, I'm not worried about him. He ain't no Christian. <laughs> but he was. He was. You know what the trouble was? The trouble was he got too near the devil's fire. That's what happened. He tried to warm himself the devil's fire, and he got in trouble. Uh, keep a distance between you and the world. Keep a distance between you and these people that, uh, that don't have no use for Jesus Christ. And when they, when they laud you and praise you and pat you on the back, you want to never forget something. That's the same world that nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. You better have never forget that, some of you Christians, especially some of you girls. I mean, that, that, that young fellow, you know, that's uh, so much fun to be around this and that, how does he respond to Jesus Christ? I'll tell you what, next time you're out on a double date with him, you know, and playing the old cat and mouse game, why don't you just witness to him about Jesus Christ and see how it goes. See if he goes into spasms of elation and starts jumping up and down with joy. <laughs> they have no use for Jesus Christ, never had any use for Jesus Christ, never will have any use for Jesus Christ. The backslide if you don't. Now, I don't say you have to be fanatical like some of us. I mean, I'll include myself in the among the fanatics, you know. I, I, I don't say you have to be like that. You don't have to go all the way, but, but it'd be nice if you did. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, you, I don't know whether you knew Jack Palou or not, but he was a character. And he was the one, is it Jim or Jack that's running for president? That's, that's Jack I'm talking about. He was down here, you know, years ago, about 20 years ago. You know what he did one time? He went to pool hall in town, pool hall here in town, and walked in there and walked with the biggest, toughest guy in that place he could find. I mean, a bruiser. And he said, I'm going to ask you a question. The guy said, I don't know you. And he said, no, you don't know me, but I'm a Christian. I'm a preacher. And he said, well, I think all Christians are sissies. <laughs> and Jack Fuller said, well, I bet I'm tougher than you are. <laughs> and this guy put on his pool cue and said, we'll see about that. And Jack said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I got, I got enough guts to do something you don't dare do. And he said, yeah, what's that? <laughs> and Jack said, I'll tell you what. If you've got enough guts to pull out that plug on that Nickelodeon, there's a jukebox playing there in that pool hall. If you've got enough guts to pull that out where you didn't put any money in it, i got enough guts to stand that pool table and preach. And the guy said, you're on. <laughs> well, then he yanked out that thing, and he got up the pool table and preached. And he hadn't talked about two minutes the door open, the cook came with a butcher knife just screaming, raving mad, because he had, he had put the money in the, in the juke thing. And the big fellow took a cue stick and just stepped across from him and said, hold it, bud. And of course, like that, he ain't through yet. <laughs> and let the guy preach. Let him preach. Now, now listen, I don't say you have to be that wild, you see. I don't say that. But it'd be good if you could be. <laughs> I mean, Christ said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the thing that I say? And that's the business. Why, there's some people in this uh, country that take a beating for Jesus Christ. I mean, they've really taken a beating for Jesus Christ, and some of you never really suffered anything for Jesus Christ. You take Eddie Lieberman, the Jewish evangelist, you take that fellow, he, when he got saved, he, his, he, had, he was a Jewish, he was a thoroughbred Jew, and when he got saved, his parents and his grandparents had a fit, and finally his grandmother called him out the back porch one day, about the time they heard he wanted to be a Jewish evangelist. And they called him out there in the back porch, and his, his grandmother showed him a box there and said, open it, boy. And he opened that box, and in that box was $20,000 in $100 bills. 20,000 bucks, man, $100 bills. You know what she said to him? She said, uh, Eddie, she said, you're breaking your mother's and your daddy's heart with this religion you got. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll give you all that right now. You can just take it with you if you just give up this Jesus Christ. Eddie just reached over and took his hand and shut the box down like that when this thing walked out the door. That was in 1950. 20,000 bucks, a lot of money in 1950. That's worth about 100,000 now. 
and to slap the down, went on to spend the rest of his life as an evangelist, preaching the Word of God. You say, why? He wasn't ashamed of Jesus Christ. You ought to confess Christ your Savior because you'll backslide if you don't. That isn't all. You'll probably get chastened. You'll probably get whipped if you don't. I don't know how bad a whipping you're going to get, but a child of God that's ashamed of Jesus Christ is going to get it because Christ said, uh, I call you no more servants but friends, and a servant doesn't know what his master does, but you know what I'm doing, so if not, I'll call you friends. Or if you're his friend and you're ashamed to confess him, don't you know that God the Father is going to get kind of concerned about that? I mean, if he wasn't ashamed to confess you and you're ashamed to confess him, don't you know his father is going to get a little bit disturbed and put out with you? <laughs> you take Jonah, wants to run from the Lord, and the Lord says, go down there and witness and preach, and he says, I'm not going. And the Bible said he went down to Joppa, then he went down into a ship, then he went down into the bottom of the ship and was fast asleep. Then if that weren't enough, he went uh, down in the water. And if that weren't enough, he went down in the belly and the mouth of the whale. If that weren't enough, the whale swam down to the bottom of the mountains. You know what that course is? That course is straight down. That course is down all the way. What's that from? That's for being ashamed to do what God told you to do. Witness. You know, when I first got saved, I went off to Bob Jones University. And the first Sunday I was there, I went into chapel. And I got into chapel. When I got into chapel, uh, they got up there to preach. And lo and behold, the guy that got up to preach had on a clerical collar and a robe. And it was a robe choir. And I sat there that Sunday morning, looked at that mess, and I said, Hey, man, I just left this mess. <laughs> I'm not getting back in it again. And the next Sunday, I didn't go to chapel. The next Sunday, I went off out in the country and tried to find me a good old country Baptist church someplace. I didn't know much where to go, so I just kind of shopped around. And I got out there. You know what I ran to? I, I was out at a place called Pelham. And out in Pelham, I, I, I knew I was the right place. I thought I was anyway, because while well, I got within about an uh, uh, eighth of a mile of it, I could hear the place just rocking. Everybody pray at the same time, you know, having a time. And I went in that place, went up a back stairway to a prayer room where they're all having a prayer meeting. And I mean, they're all up there praying at one time, having them a time. And a big old farmer came running down the stairs and overalls out of that prayer meeting and met me on the landing. And he picked me up and gave me a big old hug, you know, never saw him before in his life. Picked me up, hugged me, and threw me against the wall and said, Glory to God, went on down the stairway. <laughs> I said, This is the right place. This is the right place. <laughs> So I went there from that, from, that, from that on. But then on I went there. I'll never forget what happened there. A Jew got saved. And he got saved, and he was going to get baptized the next week, and he came out to get baptized. When he came out to get baptized the next week, his, uh, his uncle came and sat there in the audience with a 38 caliber pistol and shot him coming out of the baptistry. And didn't kill him. Didn't kill him, but wounded him. Not a, not a, not a bad wound, kind of superficial wound. Wasn't too bad. And he was in the hospital about a couple of weeks, you know, and got out. And while he was in the hospital, they decided to prefer charges against him. And they tried to get this fellow to prefer charges against him, and he wouldn't do it. And the uncle finally came to the bedroom and sat down by this fellow's bed just weeping and apologized for what he'd done and thanking God that they weren't going to prosecute him for what he'd done. And he'd be crying. He said, Abe, he said, Abe, you're breaking your mother's heart. You've got to give up this Jesus stuff, this Jesus stuff. You're just tamped the family. You don't know what you're doing. You, you've got to quit. And he said, and that wounded Jew sat up in that bed and said, I'll never quit Jesus Christ. He's my Messiah. And boy, about four weeks after that, I was out at that country church, Pelham Baptist Church, out there in the winter. And that Jew got up in the hospital. He'd been out of the hospital about two weeks. And he got out of the hospital and came to that meeting. And we were having a time of it that night. Now, they were climbing the post, you know, and hanging off the lintel of the door place and everything else and running around the building. Good meeting, you know, good meeting. And I think it was going like that, and about that time they began to sing the old time religion. They got that verse that said, "'Twas good for the Hebrew children, "'twas good for the Hebrew children, "'twas good for the Hebrew children, "'and it's good enough for me." And they got right to that verse and got about halfway through it, "'twas good for the Hebrew children." And that Jew stood up in that building and said, "'Stop the music!' <laughs> and they stopped the music and he said, "'What do you mean it was good for the Hebrew children? "'It is good for the Hebrew children!' <laughs> Now, you know what that fellow's case was? That fellow's case was he wasn't ashamed of Jesus. Are you ashamed of Jesus? I mean, the bride says, this is my friend. This is my friend, old daughters of Jerusalem. Uh, do you get kind of embarrassed when they, they ask you to introduce your friend? Does it upset you? Does it disturb you? I knocked the door of a house here one time in this town. A fellow came to the door, and I said, I'd like to talk to you a few minutes if I could. 
about the Lord. He said, I don't want to talk about church stuff. I said, I'm not going to talk to you about church stuff. I'd like to talk to you about Jesus Christ. He said, I don't want to talk about that stuff at all. I said, you don't want to talk about Jesus Christ? He said, no. I said, okay, I'm not coming in to see you around. Bye-bye. I don't go in a house where Jesus Christ can't come in. If Jesus Christ can't come in the house, shut the door. I'll stay outside. Amen, amen, amen. If I can't bring my friend in with me, then me and my friend stay outdoors. You take me, you take my friends. If you want to take my friends, then cancel it. Call it out. We, we give you visitors cards. I know sometimes visitors don't make them out. I know that, and I know why. You know, I'm, I'm kind of that way myself, you know. I mean, you, they, they just want a record of me so they can come around and see me, you know. <laughs> and that's what it's for, you know. I mean, pay back a visit. But, but we're not really that bad about it. I mean, if you don't want the visit paid, we won't pay it. If we come around the door and knock the door and you don't like us, just say, get out and slam the door. <laughs> it's okay. It's nothing to me one way or another. You can't win them all. But the thing is, me and my friend are together. You don't take me apart from him. You don't take him apart from me. When you accept Christ your Savior, now you better think about this before you get saved. <laughs> when you accept Christ your Savior, you get into a family. And I'm in the family. You better be careful what kind of company you'll keep. <laughs> I mean, birds of a feather flock together. It must be a horrible shock to some of the brethren to know I'm saved. I mean, it's up a horrible shock to some of them. That fellow out in California, Hot Dog Heimer, you know, he decided I'm not saved. He was out there working with a fellow named Bobby Bible, a street preacher out there in California, and he and Bobby Bible were trying to get thick, and Bobby Bible was bragging about him, and Heimers didn't want to have Bobby Bi uh, Bible know how he felt about me because Bobby Bible was one of my friends too. And so Heimer's writing out all across the country behind Bobby Bible's back. He was writing, I have proved conclusively that Ruckman is demon-possessed and unconverted. So I got my little letters and sent to Bobby Bible. That rattled his cage, boy. Let me tell you something. When you trust Christ, you get in the family. And whether you like it or not, I'm your brother. Amen. I am your brother. Amen. See? And, I mean, I get just nervous about it. Some of you do. <laughs> 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 All right, God will chase you if you don't. I want to say something else about it. You won't have any assurance till you do. The reason why many a child of God lacks assurance is because they've never confessed Christ, or if they have confessed Christ, they've only done it once or twice, then they quit. You start that stuff, and first thing you know, you begin to doubt your salvation. I have never known a consistent witness for Christ, a person that consistently witnessed through the years that ever had any serious doubts about the salvation. But if you don't witness, then you do have doubts about your salvation. I mean, I understand what I'm saying. You don't have to be as fanatical as I am about it. And, and, and I've run through the years to kind of cool it on certain occasions. And certain occasions you should cool it. Um, you don't give a guy a track while he's working on a buzz saw, you know, or a bench press. And uh, I mean, if when you take a lunch, time off for lunch out of the place, the guy don't want to talk to you, leave him alone and talk to him later after you get off the work. And this way, you use your head, see. But you take when they have an opportunity to witness, then speak up. I was getting a haircut one time in a barber shop right here in Pensacola. And was out there in Brownsville. I, I think it's still there, although it's done a lot of tearing down around Brownsville. I think it's still there, but uh, I was in there getting a haircut, and there was a bunch of fellas in there, about oh, eight or nine men, you know, most of them in the 40s or 50s. And uh, they were talking about the Kinsey Report. The Kinsey Report's a, a dirty book, you know. They put a dirty book out every couple of years under the, under the idea that folks need all this information about sex. This country got some it must information about sex. It's just sex nutty, man. You can find anything you want to find out about, about sex. Anybody can find anything in one newsstand less than 15 minutes. It's just flooded with this junk. And this thing was called the Kinsey Report. And the Kinsey Report was just a dirty book, you know, under the, under the profession of helping folks out. And these fellows sitting around talking about the Kinsey Report and joking about it and laughing about it, you know, and putting some dirty stuff in with it. When I was up in the barber chair getting my hair cut, my ears were burning. I mean, uh, when you get saved, you don't look at things like you used to. And you may have noticed this as soon as you got saved that uh, you didn't appreciate dirty jokes like you used to. You may have noticed that. I mean, before you're saved, you get in there and big fun him, laugh at him. After you get saved, it embarrasses you. And I was up there and thinking, well, what am I going to do something to break this mess up? And I was trying to think if there was something to do and pray and ask God to show me what to do. And I remembered two other fellows in the same position. One was Jack Hiles. 
And Jack Kyle was in a barber chair like that one time, half shaved. And what he did was he got up with a towel around his neck and the lather on his face and wore, walked out the door. He paid for half of it to get done because only half shaved. He gave the guy half his money and walked out the door. I said, if you want me to do that, I'll do that. And then I remember Lee Robertson. Lee Robertson got in a situation like that. And Lee Robertson got in that situation. He just stood up straight up in the chair after about 20 minutes of it and said, shut up! <laughs> and so I said, if you want me to do that, I'll do that. And the Lord said, no, you got some tracks on you. Give them some tracks. And I had a track called, Whatever a Young Man Should Know. And whatever young man should know shows a young fellow in the front of the track winking at you and inside like this. And then you open the first page, and the first page, the guy on the ground with a snake squeezing him to death and a bunch of skull lying around, you know, and it says, be sure your sin will find you out. And the second page, you know, he's got a fellow necking a girl in a car, and then her name is Sin. The Holy Spirit's pointing at the fellow and saying, you better look at what you're messing with. It's a real cool track, you know. And the back side of the white throne judgment, you know. God shall bring thee into judgment with every secret work, whether it be good or evil. And I had that track. So I, the Lord said, you just take that track and give him that track. So I got through with my haircut, and I went around, and I took out those tracks. I said, boys, I said, I heard you talking about this Kimsey report, this sex stuff. I said, that ain't the latest, boy. You want the latest hot, hot stuff, hot right off the press. This is it, boy. Get a load of this. I went around and passed them things out. They grabbed them like hotcakes. <laughs> One of them said, is that it? I said, yeah, man, that's it. And gave it to him and all. And I, and I stepped back in the middle of that room and looked across there. That place was just as quiet as Yankee Stadium at 4 o'clock in the morning. By eight guys sitting there, like this, you know, like this. One old fellow grabbing those things and said, that's it, is it, that's it. <laughs> I said, oh. <laughs> Stuck in this pocket. And I said, gentlemen, I said, I've heard the word hell mentioned this place eight times here in the last 30 minutes. And I want to say, if you don't repent of your sin, that's where you're going. Good day, gentlemen. Walked out the door. You, they had an eight-inch fan sitting over there on the, on the, on the wall. You sit going, whew, whew. You say, what good does that do? It does plenty of good, brother. It does plenty of good. Let me tell you something. One little old thing like that can make more of an impact on a fella than going to 50 services. I mean, a guy come to a revival service or a church service, he can just slough it off and say, oh, well, they're talking about somebody else. But you can't pass off anybody else. You get in a mess like that. The thing you do is speak up. Speak up. Open your mouth. Speak up. I used to go out with a young fella. His name is Jim Warnock. I did admire the guy. He and I weren't a bit alike, and I, I could never be like him. He could never be like me. He was raised right. And, uh, you know, Jim Warner taught me a great lesson in life. He taught me sometimes a fellow who looks like a sissy and talks like a sissy is not a sissy at all. I learned that being around Jim Warner. He was clean, as clean as a hound's tooth. I don't think he ever drank anything strong in buttermilk all his life. And that guy was raised in a Christian day school, in a Christian junior high school, in a Christian high school, you know. PCS, BJU, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, pink, rosy cheeks, you know, and, and you know, coke, get him drunk. I mean, one of those real clean-cut fellas, you know. And you think he'd, he wasn't a feminine, he wasn't a queer, you know, he wasn't a faggot, but he just kind of, you know, kind of gentle, you know. And sometimes those fellows will fool you. Sometimes them guys got iron in them. And old Warnick had the iron, boy. He had the iron. Tough, boy. I mean, tough. <laughs> I remember one night, we'd come back from... North Carolina, South Carolina, someplace, and had to stop at a gas station late at night to get some gas. And a bunch of old drunks in there, and one of them mountaineers, a bunch of them playing uh, checkers over there on a table and beer cans around, and cussing and laughing, and carrying on. And we came in there about 2 o'clock in the morning. They didn't know us from Adam. It's always dangerous to introduce yourself too quick to a bunch like that. And I don't know what Jim was going to do, but he had that kind of gleam in his eye. And we got out of that thing and stepped in there, and these guys were out of blankety, 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 blank, 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 blank. And Jim stepped right in there and said, uh, oh, hey, fellas, you know my friend? <laughs> and looked up, no, who are you? I never saw you. What's your friend? I never heard of you. And he said, my friend Jesus Christ, I heard his name mentioned here. You fellas know him? <clears throat> Brother, you talk about flushing a cuppy. I mean, I'll see you around, Jim. I'll see you in the morning, Jim. Oh, so long, Sam. See you, Henry. Well, I got to go now. Uh, he cleared that place, boy, in about five seconds, man. And I saw him one time. He went down the streets of, uh, of uh, Greenville, and we were down there. I was across the street watching him, and I thought he was going to get killed. I mean, I was, I was as nervous that day as Buddy Cargo was the first time he heard Garner preach on the street. And I, I, I watched that thing over there across the street, and, and Warnock went over there. He had a wordless book with him. You ever, how many of you know what a wordless book is? All right. 
Well, that's the thing you used to use, just construction paper, just colored sheets of paper. And it was about this big, and the first sheet was, uh, was green, you know. That's a picture of Eden. The next one was black. That was the entrance of sin. The next one was red. That was the blood of Christ. The next one was white. That was salvation. And the last one was gold. A picture of New Jerusalem. It's a kid's book. See, for teaching kids in daily vacation Bible school. <laughs> Warnick, he goes across the street with that thing, and there are four Marines over there from Korea. They're all sergeants. A couple of them full gunny, you know, up, four up and three down. Let's stand there, hash marks all over them. I mean, bronze, left chest, look like an Army and Navy store stuff hanging there. Four of them over there waiting for a bus. And that guy goes over and stops right in front of him and said, Now, gentlemen, <laughs> oh my God, man. <laughs> now, gentlemen, let me show you something. Pulls out this wordless book. I think, Oh my stars, man. And he starts just like he's talking to five and six-year-old kids. He says, now this first, <laughs> I think about it, I still want to run away and hide someplace. I mean, this, this, this first green page is a picture of a beautiful garden. And once upon a time, our mothers and daddies lived in a beautiful garden where they were just like that man. And I'm telling you, I watched that bird for about five minutes. He got over there to that black sheet and that red sheet. And one of them sergeants was like this. One was like this. One was like this. <laughs> you never saw such a thing, man. And he got there in that thing, finally got there, and, and they got the gold page, and a couple of them were crying. And he said, so someday you can wind up in a beautiful city where there won't be any more sorrow and pain and crying and death. And two of them were bawling. He led two of them to Christ right in the street. The birds got down their knees by the bus stop and accepted Christ. Wildest thing you ever saw in your life, man. Now listen, you know what, you know what, we know, you know how to hold a Jim Warnock? A simple thing. He was not ashamed of Jesus Christ. He didn't care who knew it. And he didn't care what they thought of it. And what we need in this world today is some more Christians like that. All right, finally I want to say this. I want to say that you shouldn't be ashamed of Jesus Christ because you're going to live forever and ever and ever in heaven with people who are not ashamed of him. Now sometimes you forget that. Sometimes it seems like a dream world. I understand that. I understand that perfectly. Don't think I'm any different. Sometime in preaching on the great themes of the Bible, it seems to me like they're so far off and so, so uh, mystic and so, uh, so unreal compared to what you see going on around you. Sometimes it's hard to grasp them. And sometimes it's hard to realize that they're going to come true. But I cling to one thing and I keep on clinging to it. I cling to the fact that in all the promises I've read in that Bible, none of them have ever failed yet. In all the promise in that Bible, they all came true in time. And the prophecies in that Bible, the prophecies all came true in time. The Lord God has never lied one time yet. Amen. So if he lied about me being up there in glory with him, then that's the first thing he ever lied about, because he never lied about anything else. So someday I'm going to be up there. I don't know how it's going to be. I can't figure out how 10 million, 10 billion people can all give account of themselves to God and be judged. I can't figure that out. I can't figure out how the judgment seat of Christ can take place in seven years. Some kind of a computerized setup I don't fully understand. I don't understand all that. It doesn't all explain the Word of God. I don't understand how someday I'm going to see Paul and have fellowship with Paul and know what he went through and what the other Christians have been through. I don't understand all that. But I know Jesus Christ never lied one time and I'm sure he wasn't lying about that. So someday I'm going to get up there and I'm going to live forever and ever and ever and I'm going to live with the saints who suffered for the sake of Jesus Christ. And what a time that's going to be for some of us who've never suffered anything for him. What a time that's going to be. I wouldn't die, brethren, any of you. I wouldn't die and go home to glory without having made a fool out of myself for Christ's sake at least one or two times on this earth. And folks say, well, I just don't believe in making a fool out of myself. You're a liar if ever was one. There ain't a man in this building over 30 years old had not made a fool out of himself at times. No, don't tell me you haven't. You made a fool out of yourself over some woman somewhere. Yeah. Over some money somewhere. Uh-huh. Or over some hobby somewhere, some little thing, little hang-up you got. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. You did, too. You did, too. Don't sit there and lie. You did, too. You did, too. Don't tell me you haven't made a consummate ass out of yourself on a number of occasions. Now, what are you going to do? You're going to die and go home to glory and stand up there and stand up there never having been made a fool out of for Christ's sake when Paul said, we are fools for Christ's sake. Amen. Who's fool are you? 
Paul says it pleased God by the foolish of preaching to save them that believe. I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go if I hadn't made a fool out of myself at least once or twice. And if I hadn't, you know what I'd do? If I were some of you people here tonight, I'd find out a way to do it. I would find out a way to do it. I wouldn't go up there and stand beside, beside martyrs and people who've been whipped to death for Christ's sake and burned on the griddle and then racked to pieces. I wouldn't go up there and stand beside them at the same judgment seat if I hadn't done something for Jesus Christ down here that cost me something. Bless your soul, some of you characters in this building tonight, 50 and 60. I'll, I'll talk down to you now. I mean, I had to talk up to you when I was a young preacher. I don't have to anymore. I can pull my rank on you now, man. <laughs> I got 10 kids and 11 grandkids, and I'll tell you how it is, man. You get up around 50 or 60 or 70, if I were you, I wouldn't get that close to glory with nothing in my hand to show for my life for Jesus Christ. I'd find some way to make a fool out of myself some way. I'd invent a way. I'd think up a way, man. I would, I'd get a mad impulse sometimes when I'm in these airports just to stand up there in one of them seats and just sound out, you know. And I'll probably do it one of these days, too. Just If I feel like my, my computer hasn't rung up enough chips for me in glory, I may just do that just to add one more straw to the camel's back. <laughs> if I were some of you characters 50, 55, and 60, you know what I'd do? I'd go right in my hometown where I lived. I'd go right, I am mean, this is my hometown here. I've been here over 40 years. And I'd go down to the dime store and just stand at one of those rails by the lunch counter about Christmas time and say, well, Merry Christmas, folks. I'm sure it's a Merry Christmas if you know the Savior was born on this day. I'm trusting my Savior, and I know it's my Savior, and boy, it's a Merry Christmas for me. Praise God, and then walk out the door. <laughs> you haven't got the guts. <laughs> you haven't got the guts. Somebody said, well, that's a dumb thing to do. <laughs> well, you've done some other dumb things, haven't you? <laughs> Well, you might as well do something dumb for the Lord. <laughs> you're going to live forever in heaven with people who weren't ashamed of him. Listen, you're going to get up there, you ladies, you think Ruckman's, you know, so macho, you know, and, you know, so chauvinistic and all that stuff. Let me tell you something, sister. When you get up there, the Lord isn't going to sick me on you anymore. Right? You'll have all you need it down here. You get up there, the Lord's going to sick some women on you. Don't you worry about Ruckman being too tough with you. You ladies, you wait till you get up there and run into Mrs. Judson. And Mrs. Hubmeyer, you'll have your day. You take Mrs. Judson out there in the jungle, dying out there in the jungle, taking her books, uh, books her husband was translating into him while he was in prison, smuggling him in a pillowcase. Sometime he's gone off there in the jungle, and one time he got lost on a trip, was gone for 13 months, she didn't see him. Mrs. Judson getting off the ship there in Burma with her mid-Victorian dress and in the mud and the filth running down that street, and try to get a man to teach her the Burmese language, and every time he finished giving her a lesson and walked out the back door, he'd spit on the ground because it was considered a shame to teach a woman how to speak the language. Mrs. Judson, bad out there in Burma. You talk with her, you'll see her. You don't think you will, but you will. If that book is right, you will. If that book is right, you ladies, you know what you're going to run into? Bless my soul, you know what you're going to run into? You're going to run into women up there who were put by pigsties and had to watch the pigs eat their children because they wouldn't reject Jesus Christ. There are women in glory right now, if that book is right, who in the dark ages had uh, Rome get a hold of them and take them out to a pigsty and tell that mother, you either reject Jesus Christ or we're going to throw your baby to the hogs. And the mothers up there who did not reject Jesus Christ who stood there and saw pigs eat their babies. You don't have to worry about Ruckman getting too rough with you. Just don't let it enter your head. You'll get up there and God will give you some women to deal with, sister. Yeah. And they'll straighten your wagon out real quick. Mrs. Hubmeyer took her husband out. Took her husband out, burned him at the stake. Got him out there to burn him at the stake and set him on fire and he wouldn't reject Jesus Christ. When they set him on fire and he wouldn't reject Jesus Christ, when the flames started to get up by his feet, they called his wife in. They made her stand in front of him there and watch him. And they figured, well, if she gets watching that thing, she'll get so tore up she'll beg him to recant, and he'll recant. So they got her out there with a stake and got her up by the stake to watch her husband burn to death. And when the flames got up around his leg somewhere in his waist, that woman clapped her hands and said, Glory to God for Jesus and his precious martyr. Amen. 
Mm -mm. They took Miss Ubire out and hung her upside down over the, by a bridge over the Danube River in Vienna and drowned her upside down. You'll see her. You don't think you will. People down you keep thinking it's going to be like this always. You keep thinking it's just going to be buses and trains and cars and kids and bills and taxes and houses and car and gas and lights and water and books and people and kids and hospital bills, but it ain't. If that book's right, if that book's right, you're going to see them. You're going to live with them. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't want to face it. I'll tell you, I, I want the Lord to come. But I'm not, I'm not looking forward at all to seeing Apostle Paul. He makes me nervous as it is. <laughs> I've never seen a guy so cheerful and optimistic as that fellow always is. Just, I don't like him. I don't like Paul. I like Job. <laughs> I don't like Paul. Paul's always rejoice, and again I say rejoice, and we can do all things through Christ more than conquerors. The thanks be to God that always called us, but always give us the victory. In these things we're more than conquerors. And again I say rejoice, and rejoice always. And just, I mean, blood running on his back, shut up in jail, no wife, no kids, no family. Oh, rejoice the glory to God. Oh, shut up, man, shut up. <laughs> I mean, someday I'm going to get up there, I'm going to see that bird, 195 lashes. I ain't got one to show. <laughs> Not a one. I got some marks on me. I'm scarred from the battle. But not like that. Not like that. Who's your friend back there behind you? Oh, 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 him. Yeah, him. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Honor your father and your mother. What about the faith of sin? A high look and a proud heart and applying the, the wicked of sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Who's your friend, buddy? Well, uh, 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 well, uh, well, it's, uh, well, uh, what's the matter, that fellow having a little trouble? Having a little trouble there, fella? Don't, don't you talk to me about it. Love don't want to hear anything about it. I know, Chris, you don't love God enough to stick out your neck for him. You don't love Christ enough to stick out. You ought to keep your pretty little reputation just just immune, just perfect, You're going to keep your social standing just right, You're going to keep your image just right, so that nobody can think you're a, uh, a fanatic, nobody think you're a fool, you're going to be just balanced, just level, so nobody ever have one word to say bad about, about you or against you, aren't you? I know thousands of Christians like that. You're talking about love, you know what your problem is? You know what your problem is? You love yourself, that's your problem. That's your problem, your precious little stinking self. And I'll tell you, brother, it's not just limited. When I say that, I'm not just aiming at this congregation. I'm talking about Christians all over this country. I'm talking about some own kinfolk, some own relatives. Just in love with yourself, morning, noon, and night, you wouldn't stick your neck out that far. Amen, 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 amen. I feel better already having said that. <laughs> Who's your friend? Who's your friend? This is my friend, O daughter of Jerusalem. This is my loved one. Ashamed of Jesus. Christ said, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me in my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he come the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I hope here tonight, I hope here tonight, we don't have Christians here tonight who are ashamed of Jesus Christ. And if you have been ashamed, I hope you get over it. I hope you grow up. Hope you become a mature Christian. I hope the next time you have a chance to witness. Now I'm not telling you to be a radical. I'm not telling you to be a fool. I'm not telling you to be a nut. I know I get some of you young men stirred up so sometimes you do some foolish things. I understand that. But then again, I have to do that because some of you are older and you're more balanced, more conservative, and as a consequence, you're more in danger of doing nothing. If I had to go home at night, take out a piece of paper and write down a sheet of paper the things I've done just because the Lord wanted them done, that got me no glory, and got me no notoriety, and got me no profit, and got me no pleasure, just for Him, because I wasn't ashamed of Him, they wouldn't come very much. I've been saved 43 years this year, 43 years. I don't think I could write down more than 20 things. That's once every two years. I'm ashamed to confess that, but it's probably so. I'll bet some of you couldn't write down two things in 50 years. God help you. God help you. Father, 
Bless your word tonight. May the word of God take effect in the hearts tonight. We thank this young man that came already and pray might fill him with the Spirit of God and bless him. Honor his prayer and answer it in a definite way and give him the desire of his heart. You said if we delight ourselves in you, you'd give us the desires of our heart. And I pray you might grant the desire of his heart tonight. And others, Father, probably need to come, and especially somebody here tonight who has never confessed Christ publicly and openly. May this be the night they take their stand for him and walk down this aisle unashamedly and say, all right, I'm one of his. I'm one of his sheep. I'm one of his friends. I'm not ashamed of him. Now, Lord, help tonight and undertake, and God help us. God have mercy upon us. We have so much in our lives to be ashamed of. How, 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 how shamedly we've acted at times, how shamefaced and how worthy of shame we are. Vile, wretched, unclean things, stupid, weak people. And how, how many times, Lord, my own life, since I've been saved, I've done things I've just been terribly ashamed of, groaning about, just, just in an agony of tears about, so wicked, so stupid, so foolish. Lord God, if we don't do one thing in this earth while we're here, help us not to be ashamed of the blessed Son of God, Heaven's darling, the Prince of Glory, your beloved Son. God help us never to be ashamed of Him. If we're, if we're ashamed of everything about ourselves, and if our children don't act right, our families don't act right, we have cause. God help us never to look you in the face and say, Lord, I had a reason to be ashamed of your Son. Because we haven't got any. And we're never going to have any. God help us. God help us. God help us. Let's pray a while. Somebody here tonight, maybe you've never actually confessed Christ publicly. The moment we're going to stand and sing, I want to give you an opportunity tonight. Confess Him openly before men. He said, you confess me down here, I'll confess you up there. And God bless you people. If you can't confess him in a heated building with carpets and music playing and clothes on, and nobody's shooting at you, nobody threatening you, you'll never make it out there. God help you. What's that number, Miss? 385. 385. Let's turn to 385 in the hymnal and stand and sing. 385. 385 in the hymnal. Take the world and give me Jesus. 385. Now listen tonight, if you never confessed Christ your Savior publicly, why well, I ask you to come forward in the invitation. Brother Root, one of the men me down here to meet you down here when you come. And you understand this invitation is not to join the church. I'm not giving that kind of invitation right now. I'm giving you an invitation tonight to show your colors. Here am I. Here am I. I'd hate to think that if Jesus Christ walked through that door in the condition he was in when he stood before Pontius Pilate, I'd hate to think if he came here and stood right there in that kind of condition and said, does anybody here know me? I'd hate to think of myself turning away and say, I never saw the man. I'm old enough to be his daddy. I got kids older than he was. He was 33 and a half when he got murdered. 33 and a half. I've got kids over 40. I couldn't go up to him and put my arm around him. So I'll, I'll stay with you. Count on me, buddy. I'll stay with you. I wish he could. I wish he'd count on me for that. God help you. Let's sing. Take the world. Take it now. Whosoever will, let him come. Confess him before man, he'll confess you up there. You confess him down here, he'll confess you up there.